Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fourth and final live stream lecture series for disability movement, etc. Sorry that we're a little bit late today. For those of you who are joining us live, um, Lee and I were just chatting and we got time got away from us. Plus, it's, of course, that time of the year for academics when um, we have a million emails and a million things to do and not enough time in the day. Um, for those of you just joining us for the first time or listening for the first time, welcome. I am your host, Dr. Andy. I am broadcasting again from my home today, which I am very privileged to be able to do so um, with my amazingly artistic partner here in Denton, Texas, which is on the occupied lands of the Wichita and Caddo affiliated tribes. For those of you who may be hard of hearing or following along in the transcript, I, I, uh, I am a white male. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I have blonde hair, which is styled back a little bit, um, a little bit longer on the top and shorter on the side. I'm wearing my um, clear reading glasses because I'm getting to that age. I've got a, a fun black t-shirt with a gray sweater on and I'm sitting in front of my very full uh, studio and office. I am so excited for the conversation that I am going to have today with Lydia XC Brown. Um, they are, and I'm going to bring up the most recent uh, bio, they are an advocate and organizer, attorney, strategist, and writer whose work focuses on interpersonal and state violence against disabled people at the intersections of race, class, gender, sexuality, faith, language, and nation. Their policy council for privacy and data at the Center for Democracy and Technology focused on algorithmic discrimination and disability. They're also the director of policy, advocacy, and external affairs at the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. Lydia is also an adjunct lecturer and core faculty in Georgetown's disabled, uh, Disability Studies program and an adjunct professional lecturer, professorial lecturer in American University's Department of Critical Race, Gender, and Culture Studies. They serve as a commissioner on the American Bar Association's Commission on Disability Rights. They're chairperson of the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice Section's uh, Disability Rights Committee. They're co-president of the Disability Rights Bar Association and a board representative for the Disability Justice Committee to the National Lawyers Guild. Lydia founded the Fund for Community Reparations for Autistic Peoples of Color, Colors Independent Survival and Empowerment, and they are creating Disability Justice Wisdom Tarot. Lydia is past chairperson at the, of the Massachusetts Developmental Disabilities Council and former Justice Catalyst Legal Fellow at the Bazillion Center for Mental Health Law. Often the most important work that they have done has no title, no job description or funding and probably never will. I'm so excited to bring Lydia on and talk with them about the work that they do and how that is intersects with some of the work that um, I've been doing in terms of physical health and movement. And Lydia, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. I'm really jazzed to be speaking with you and uh, enjoying these conversations that, you know, I've had a few opportunities to participate in lately. And every time I feel like I get to meet a new person, I get to learn new things. And, you know, I, I leave thinking, we could keep talking for hours, but you know, we probably have other things that we need to get done. Absolutely. And and so much so during the pandemic, um, because we've been so separated that when we do find those people that we can chat with like that forever, it just seems like, oh, I just I've missed this so much. And um, you know, I have to admit that I'm having a a, a bit of you know, fangirl reaction because you, your work has been so influential in my own thinking. Um, and, you know, when I started this little show, I was like, there's no way that you would agree to do it. And the fact that you're here, I'm just so excited and so happy for our conversation. Me too. I'm excited right. too. Cool. So um, the way the show typically goes is I'm going to let you have this time um, to share a story or to share your connection with movement or how it impacts you. Um, because, you know, as we've, we talked behind the scenes and in the green room, kinesiology 
particularly in even in adapted kinesia uh, physical education and all the subdisciplines, we really lack authentic voice and we really lack recognizing disabled persons as experts and and recognizing their stories as expertise and, and the fact that they have they have the expert knowledge. They know their needs and, and what they want out of uh, this crazy experience we consider life. Um, and so I, I would love to have that opportunity if you would love to share something with us. So the floor is yours. Something that I love to do and have loved to do for a very long time is to create food for other people. I cook and I bake and I make just about everything from scratch. And one of the things that I particularly pride myself on is the ability to make food for basically any dietary restrictions. One of my bestest friends has a sensitivity to garlic and onion. Oh. People I know have a lot of texture aversions to different types of textures of food. A lot of folks I know are gluten-free for a variety of reasons. A lot of folks I know are dairy-free. Mm. A lot of people I know are vegan or pescatarian, or they observe the Orthodox or Coptic fast, mm. or they keep kosher, or they eat halal, or for any number of other reasons, religious, moral, disability, health, basic physicality, cannot eat a lot of food as it's conventionally prepared, as it's easy to find in a grocery store, or easy to find in a restaurant. And what I do is I bring my desire to make people happy through food that I make to my desire to make the world more accessible mm -hmm. and more livable. And so, you know, no matter who you are, if you tell me that you would like to eat from my table or you need a food drop off, because it's been a really tough week. You just tell me what you're craving or what kinds of food you love or what food you miss having and what kinds of restrictions you might have on that food and I will make it for you. And there's a very specific physicality to making food mm -hmm. that I don't think most mm -hmm. people think about. And I didn't even really think about it until I had the time and space, unfortunately because of COVID-19, to make food more regularly for people that I yeah. love. Before the pandemic, because my life, like so many of ours, was rushed and busy, and I was often traveling for work and advocacy-related reasons, I didn't have as much time to spend hours at a time in a kitchen. I just didn't have that time, even though I've yeah. always loved to make food for other people. I've always loved to bring joy to people and to bring comfort. You know, how I was raised when you know that someone has had a death in the family, you bake something or you cook something and you bring it to their house. Yeah. When you learn that yeah. a new person has moved into your neighborhood, you bake something or you cook something and you bring it over there to welcome them. When mm. someone is experiencing an exciting life event, they are celebrating a new child in the family. They're celebrating an engagement. They have a new job. We order our lives in so many different cultural contexts around celebrating with food at home, yeah. in their kitchen, in yours, at a picnic table, at a restaurant. And, you know, of course, race and class and gender and religion all play a role in determining what are the spaces in which we will be engaging with food. But yeah. at the end of the day, someone somewhere, either in a kitchen at home or an industrial kitchen or in a factory where foods are processed had to make the food that shows up on your plate. And what I've experienced over the last almost two years of making food nearly every single day, where almost everything on our plates is something that I made with my hands, is that there is a very specific physicality to this process. I've learned that while I often move through the way, through the world, I move through the world in a way that people assume means that I am a completely able-bodied person. I've always mm -hmm. known that my disabilities affect parts of my body. And mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of extremely fancy equipment in my kitchen. And so when I'm making dough, I am beating it myself. I am kneading it myself. I am folding it in myself. And so when I present to you my bagels, my mm. challah, my focaccia, a lot of physical labor went into preparing that dough that turned into an offering of food. 
when I present to you a Thai curry, Penang curry, Masaman curry that I made where I had to make the Nam Prek myself because mm -hmm. of the person who can't have garlic and onions. So normally you have garlic, you have onion, you have shallot in yeah. that. I yeah. had to grind the curry paste together mm. by hand. I did it with limited tools and limited space. And sometimes it takes hours. A few weeks yeah. ago, for a friend who had just had a couple of surgeries, who has some chronic illnesses, like so many folks in my life and in my communities, told me that they were craving crab cakes. And mm. I knew that you know few people would be eating the crab cakes I had to prepare all of the ingredients by hand. I had wow. to create the mustard. I had to create the mayonnaise. I had to create the Worcestershire sauce that you put into crab cakes. The Worcestershire mm -hmm. sauce alone took eight hours to prepare and to yeah. cook. And then to create the actual crab cakes requires a very delicate process by which you have to fold together these large pieces of very slippery crab with, mm. your, with your mayo, mustardy, Worcestershire sauce, Old Bay, egg, et cetera, mix, and fold it in so that each one becomes a recognizable cake and yet is not squished or otherwise turned into an unrecognizable mush. But mm -hmm. it's very easy for them to fall apart. Because if you're not precise in just the right way, you will end up either with a weird array of crab tasting stuff or you will end up with, you know, like a big mound of, I guess, what is technically a monster crab cake, which is probably not what you're trying to create. And so, yeah. you know, just in the last week, um, I've created a Minshit Abesh Alech Awat which is um, a, a dish that's served in um, Amharinya and Tigrayan context, what we normally call Ethiopian food. I yeah. made uh, masaman curry. Uh, I've made, and just in the last week, uh, I made frioles refritos. And each of those things requires um, becoming really um, physically aware of the movement involved in bringing food to the table. Um, the, the refried beans, I mash them by hand. I slowly stir in the heavy cream that gives them the texture that we're so used to from a nice restaurant. Mm. The masamon curry requires grinding the paste together, grinding the shrimp paste into the tomatoes, into the lemongrass, into the macro lime leaf, Right? It, it requires a really specific physicality to make yeah. the abash alicha, to have the meat be tender and soft and infused with the flavor of the gulet, which is the base sauce that it is then cooked mm -hmm. in, requires physically reaching in to make the meat into the right texture. Right, And it's something you could do with mm -hmm. tools, but the most mm -hmm. basic tool that we have and that not everyone has equal access to are our hands. And mm. I think I probably caused more pain in my hands from cooking and baking activities than I mm. have from the standard repetitive motion injuries that many people experience from computer usage. I think yeah. it's, it's primarily been the baking. And, you know, even before we started our, our conversation, I had just finished a, a very physically exhausting mm. dough beating. Yeah. Okay, out of context, it sounds really bad. <laughs> it is so, it's meant to be beaten. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll be taking it out to rise when we're done. Yeah. I, I love that. That um, is such a unique story and a perspective of, of movement that I don't think many of us really consider. Um, particularly as you know we have technology that comes into our house right and and i don't think many of us recognize those as as really accommodation tools right i mean um like you said baking 
doing all of these different dishes and, and I love to cook. My wife is a baker. Um, so we love making cookies and doing everything by hand and um, putting all these things together, but we don't ever recognize that we have a mixer, which helps with certain recipes because you know, I don't have the, the necessarily the stamina to, to whip something so much to get it to arise or, or I would need lots of practice to be able to do so. And I don't think we ever think about that. And, and I don't think kinesiologists especially, um, and I am speaking for sort of generally and broadly, but I don't think we consider the making of food in, in our, our idea of what physical activity is. You know, we just sort of, we consider kind of the, the consumption of calories and, and look at food and sort of the base root molecule level of food and sort of the same thing with exercise and trying to find some fictitious balance but yet we don't look at these aspects of life that can bring so much joy and go look that's movement if you're sitting there making all that sourdough you're you're burning calories you're getting movement you're moving your body i'm sure you're going to be sore in your hands and your arms tomorrow once you're done doing everything with that dough so it's just i'm, I'm really glad that you shared that story it was really cool yeah. My hands right now are upset because I was whipping it uh, before mm. we got on. Um, and I don't have a stand mixer. Uh, I would love one. And yeah. I put it on my dream wish list if, you know, some mm -hmm. rich patron decides, hello, I'd like to gift you with like this amazing stand yeah. mixer featured on some fancy cooking show. I'll be like, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. But <laughs> in the meantime, uh, I've got me. Uh, and mm -hmm. whoever I can enlist to help, because, you know, that's the other thing about about cooking and baking is it brings people together to the kitchen, too. Yeah. I have a hard time with slicing. And so if I know that I'm working on a recipe that involves a lot of slicing, I have someone mm -hmm. over. I make them do it. I mean, can I do it myself? Sure, but it will take about three to four times as long and it won't look as pretty where yeah. if I have a friend do that part of it, It'll be done faster and then they get to enjoy it fresh off the stove or fresh out of the oven. Exactly. Win-win. I mean, one, you're making me hungry. But two, I hope at some point to have an invite because your food sound delicious. Um, and out my creations uh, on my Instagram. I post all of the food oh, that I create there. Oh, I'm so going to have to insta stock you afterwards so um but in a good way right because it's just looking at food <laughs> um and and i i think the other point you brought up too about community around food is another aspect that i notice in of course in sport and in community recreation and in leisure activities that it's that it is a space where folks from different backgrounds, whatever those identities might be, can find common unity. Um, you know, I, I just so happened to have finished a, a chapter recently um, for a book that I have that should be, that'll be coming out next year. Um, but I looked at the, of course, the barriers to disability, um, the disabled persons engaging in activity. And knowing though, and what I found is it's kind of this dual nature where the systems we have put in place have such ableist barriers that are persistent and pervasive yet when you when you do get to that individual experience you see folks who are who find sport or movement to be a place that they find connection that they find spaces and people who you know maybe they don't share the exact same trauma, but there's that camaraderie there. And when you talk about food and community, I just think, you know, my wife is Italian and she grew up, um, she spent time and in Costa Rica. Italian. <laughs> so you know all about it, right? It, it is connection to food. It is me. And you shared this already, but things that are celebratory for us always have some food involved. You know, we have before the pandemic, our yeah. food shows us right are the grave injustices in our society yeah. too because we don't all yeah. have equal access not even just to ingredients or specific foods but to time yeah. or space to Absolutely. cook or bake, to be able to prepare food not everyone has the energy or the spoons 
to be able to make yeah. food. And folks who are institutionalized or, in, or incarcerated are literally deprived of the opportunity to exercise much, if any, autonomy at all over what kinds of food they can yeah. make. And, um, you know, like what kinds of food we laud to in society as common foods for everyone or foods that everyone should know how to make and what foods we are socialized to believe are exotic or gross or often highly racialized and highly classed. Even for those of us who are people of color, yeah. we're still taught to internalize messages that our ancestral foods are stinky or not suitable for public presentation. But suddenly, if it becomes trendy for certain white people to discover mm -hmm. one of our foods, then then it mm -hmm. enters into a space of, oh, now it can become unattainable to mm -hmm. eat and participate in enjoying foods that have been consumed for hundreds or in some cases thousands of years without trying to see folks who don't come from a specific culture, including sometimes other people of color, right? talking about like what's more authentic and you know the way that i engage with food myself um, i try to be really conscious of where my food comes from which is a privilege mm -hmm. to be able to do and yeah. think through what it means to prepare foods as i often do that don't come from cultures that i have an historical or an ancestral connection to what does it mean for me to be able to celebrate and learn about foods that are beloved in common in cultures and communities that I might not be part of? And what does it mean for me to take foods that do come from heritage that I have connection to and to be able to come up with a new twist on it, to prepare mm -hmm. that food in, in a new and interesting way? And what does it mean to share those experiences with people who are in my life? Yeah. I find that well, so sorry. fascinating. Oh, oh really? great story was uh, a few months ago, my, my partner's favorite food is uh, hand-pulled noodles or lam yan, which are commonly mm. served um, throughout the country of China. And hand-pulled noodles come from Uyghur and Hui cultures, and they are literally pulled by hand. Uh, and usually you, you'll eat them with meat, often lamb, uh, sometimes beef or chicken, or you might eat them with vegetables. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, everyone who is a real aficionado for hand-pulled noodles says you can't make them gluten-free. But I wanted uh, one of my best friends who can't have gluten to be able to enjoy them as well. And everywhere says you cannot possibly make hand-pulled noodles gluten-free. You have to use gluten. There's no way you can get the right texture. You cannot get mm -hmm. the noodles to stay together. You're not going to be able to pull them if you try to do it without gluten. Just don't even bother. And, yeah. you know, I, I read through all of these articles about the art and the science of making hand-pulled noodles that said, don't even try. And I said, mm -hmm. fuck that. We're <laughs> trying. This is happening come hell or high water because I am not yeah. making food that only one other person can eat. I am making food that all of us can eat mm. and enjoy together. So I am figuring this out. Spoiler I alert, that. I did. I made oh. them and they were great. That's awesome. And now that I know that, my wife is gluten free. She's been gluten free for a long time. Um, I want that recipe so we can. I can might be able to surprise her if, as long as she doesn't listen to the show, <laughs> which she probably will. Um, yeah, we can still be a surprise. I just won't tell her when I do it. She'll just show up with these hand pulled gluten free noodles. Um, awesome. That's so cool. Uh, and and I think you know if we if we go a little bit more on this, so I might have to rebrand as a food show, but because um, it's it's just been fascinating. But I do love, I do love the connection of food and the idea of community, and even this connection to privilege and and how certain groups, no matter who they are, you know, have may have access to food, might have access to time, might have access to the resources, and I feel that that is so parallel to movement. You know, when we talk about being physically active and moving your body, it is a privilege, particularly, um, you know, for folks who might live in urban settings where they don't have necessarily safe spaces or even green spaces to be physically active. Or if you have folks who, um, you know, I had a neighbor uh, for a long time who worked, he worked two jobs. Um, and he'd leave at six in the morning, he'd get back around, um, 
you know, noon or one, have some lunch, and then he'd leave to go to his second job and he'd get home around 11 o'clock. And when you think about folks like that, you know, they're the messages they're eat better, do more physical activity, you're not doing well. And it's like, okay, well, where's, where's the time? And, you know, they don't even have necessarily the privilege just and so people who focus on movement is make it so people can do movement right i don't think there's necessarily an intention of many kinesiologists to to make people feel bad that they don't do stuff or um but years and years of doing the same thing haven't really made life better outside of those sort of in very select privileged groups. Um, and I know a lot of your work focuses on this a aspect of disability rights and, and often the intersection of different identities. So how do you, how do you see those, you know, as somebody who's not an insider of, of kinesiology, right? How do you see those elements play out in, in spaces where movement or physical activity occur? You know, for one thing, I want to be really clear about our framing. And yeah. I don't describe most of my work as disability rights. I describe my work as committed to and informed by a practice of disability justice, which mm -hmm. is not the same thing as rights. And yeah. the reason why is because rights itself is a really limiting framework. The rights mm -hmm. framework asks us to consider political, civil, legal, and human rights our negative and positive rights, mm -hmm. our rights against discrimination or abuse, our rights to, for example, representation, freedom of speech, mm -hmm. our right to practice religion or not to practice religion. Like those are legal, political, and civil and human rights. Mm -hmm. But justice says, while thinking about rights and doing rights-based advocacy is necessary, it will always be insufficient. Mm -hmm. Because rights that are not going to oppression, like ableism, and that's what it is, if we're really clear about what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Ableism is not bad words, it's not bad attitudes, it's not ignorance. Ableism is oppression. Ableism mm -hmm. is violence. We can have a right to non-discrimination, but does that right mean anything when all of the gyms that are adhering to the Americans with Disabilities Act regarding public accommodations are located in white rich neighborhoods. Does it yeah. matter if we have a right to non-discrimination, but our primarily property tax funded public school system means that people that live in lower income communities who are disproportionately likely to be immigrants, disabled, or people of color are actually receiving equal opportunity in education. We might have a right yeah. to non-discrimination in healthcare, but we know that people are dis discriminated against by doctors and in hospitals constantly. You might have a right to non-discrimination in employment and the right to freedom of speech on paper, but we know that people that people do get discriminated against in employment literally all the time. And that that is why disabled folks have a poverty rate that is consistently higher than non-disabled people. It's why disabled people have higher rates of homelessness than non-disabled people. It's why disabled people have higher rates of unemployment than non-disabled people just consistently across the board. And so when we're looking at those realities, the question of who actually has access to the ability to move is largely defined by geographies of race, by geographies of disability, by geographies of class. You mentioned an example of people who might be living in cities. Well, that can cut both ways. If you live in a city and you are able physically to walk, you may get a lot of physical movement available to you just in the course of existing and living and working in a city. You also might not have the ability to move about. It depends. Where in the city are you? Are there safe paths to be walking on in the part of the city where you live? Are there clear areas meant for pedestrians? Are the places that you need to go to within a reasonable walking distance based on your body and where you live and your other responsibilities in the day or not? Do you have the ability to store a bicycle safely and to be able to take that with you? Do you have the physical ability to ride a bike based on your particular body characteristics or not? Are you 
able to move about in the type of job that you have, right? Because there are ways in which folks who are doing manual or physical labor are moving quite a bit, but often in ways that are more likely to cause injury, to re-injure existing injuries, to exacerbate those injuries, or to cause new injuries, including the ability to cause new injuries that lead to long-term disability. Whereas people who are in white collar jobs are perhaps less likely to be moving during the work during the work day, but also in just as likely to have repetitive motion caused injuries from typing. Uh, that, but a factory worker or someone who's gutting turkeys on on a line might also have a repetitive motion injury, a high risk for having that occur. Someone who's working in a warehouse, somebody who is doing loading and unloading for stocking. Um, you know, so there is there is physicality and movement are not limited to only certain classifications of people. The ability to be able to move because one desires to can be directly tied to privilege, right? What kind of privilege do you have? That you have the resources, the space, the time, and a life way that allows you to choose when and how you are moving or not. Mm -hmm. But make no mistake, the ways in which people move, what kind of movement we engage in, the extent to which we can move are shaped profoundly by systematic injustices that cause individual deprivation. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's just, um, absolutely. And I, I appreciate you correcting me and, and reframing that because I think a lot of times, you know, particularly f- for folks who don't necessarily engage in this work regularly, um, even though I, I bias to believe, I think we should all, but, I think oftentimes that idea of rights and justice is used interchangeably and in, in hearing from you now often incorrectly um, when we do try to talk about it. And so, you know, how, how do we do better? You know, how might non-disabled practitioners better support disabled individuals in their movements or in trying to be physically active or even trying to move their body? How, how might that occur? You know, I think that reframing conversations always begins with challenging the underlying assumptions we bring to the conversation. For example, most folks who encounter the concept of disability for the first time may be wondering, you know, what counts as a disability? Who counts as being disabled or having a disability? And does disability necessarily involve movement or limiting movement? And the answer is, To the first one, disability can encompass a wide variety of experiences, but, you know, as Moya Bailey and Amani Barburn and Talila Lewis have repeatedly named, who becomes disabled and in what ways people become disabled are largely shaped by race and by class and gender and other axes of oppression and domination. The answer to the second one of does disability necessarily implicate movement is sometimes There are disabilities, plenty of them, that affect the ways in which we move, regularly, episodically, or chronically. And if we allow ourselves to expand on what it is we assume can count legitimately as a disability, who experiences disability, how disability shows up, especially in marginalized communities, then we're going to be having a very different conversation than if we started by making the very faulty assumption that we're all on the same page about what disability is, about how disability shows up, and even about, you know, what movement is, what health is. That concept health has often been very profoundly weaponized and has a a loaded history with the history of the eugenics movement of of defining health based upon racial supremacy of of whiteness and defining health based on ability to be productive or industrious under capitalism when, you know, it shouldn't mean that. Healthy should mean what does it mean to be well? And how can Mm -hmm. we help ourselves and support one another in being able to experience wellness and recognizing that what is wellness for each one of us might be present or absent for a myriad of reasons, and that what that might be defined as can be largely shaped by cultural and societal norms, as well as what 
we want out of our own lives. And that what looks like health or wellness for one person is not necessarily what looks like health or wellness for another. And that what looks like health or wellness is also not limited to just, again, the sheer physicality of what is a person's body doing? What is the functional capacity of a particular body or lack of capacity? But is also, is this person supported? Is this person part of an ecological system of care? Is this person connected to community? Because we know that community connection and its, its opposite isolation are determinants of health that people who experience greater isolation and loneliness die on average earlier than people who report having close connections, that people who are routinely engaged and connected with their communities, whether that is in a recreational way, through working, through living around other people, through spiritual work, that people who are able to be connected to their communities have longer lifespans and the ability to access more support and therefore to be connected to various forms of care, whether we think about it as health care or not, than people who are more isolated, who don't have those community connections, who are not engaged with communities around them. And when we think about the high rates of loneliness that disabled people report uh, compared to non-disabled people, when we think about the ways in which people from a variety of marginalized communities, queer and trans people, religiously marginalized people, people of color, people who are living in really rural areas, often experience extremely high rates of isolation or of abuse or of neglect. We are talking about a public health crisis. We are. And to try to have a conversation about wellness or health or to talk about disability or to think about movement without being clear about what the conversation is even about, what assumptions have we made about what constitutes health or what constitutes disability or what constitutes movement, then we are not doing ourselves any favors. It just brings up so, so much for me. And, and I've been, I mean, I've been having very similar patterns of thought. And I mean, you just put so many words to these thoughts. Um, and I, I think the more I've looked at this and the more I've had the privilege to engage in this topic and um, examine the idea of movement, physical activity and health and wellness is that so, so much of it, um, you know, particularly for, for folks with disabilities, because they tend to be the groups that I work with, is, is it is so much, it, it's not something you can isolate. It's not something that we can look at completely on its own in a vacuum that's separate from other aspects of people's lives. Um, and I know you already mentioned the idea of spoons, right? That, you know, so many, once you've used up all your spoons for the day, you know, that's kind of it. Um, and, and everybody's, of course, different. You start the day, perhaps in a different space than days before, all depending on these many, 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 many factors um, that we often either don't consider or don't recognize or, or simply don't address particularly because too many researchers, I think, look more like me um, and less like other folks across the country, right? And and so our ideas potentially within academia, potentially even within kinesiology, may be very narrowly defined simply because of, as you mentioned, all of these other baked in oppressions that exist for whatever reason. And those ultimately filter down and influence how we go about working with folks to make people um not make people but to help folks have the tools they need to to live a life that is as um you know healthy as they may or may not want to be and you know in the past few months i've had the privilege to be able to sit and think about these topics because you know the the joy and burden of being an academic professor is that you are paid to think um and I've had the ability to sit with the with the un, idea of these pervasive and ableist barriers to movement, and kind of based on what you just mentioned, how can how can we shift our praxis within the field to to be more equitable to address some of these historical oppressions that you know. If we don't ignore them, they're not going to go away. 
or sorry, if we ignore them, they won't go away, right? But to address them in today's climate is perceived as a as a radical move. How how do we help others along so that we, you know, we do find or, or we can find a similar space in which we can engage and actually make um, make this world a more equitable place? I think uh, in my experience, it's never helpful to approach a conversation or really any interaction with someone with, today I am going to convince you of X. Mm. Because if that's where you're starting from, you're probably doomed to fail. But if instead what we're thinking about, how can I expand this space mm -hmm. to allow for a possible shifting of ideas, a shift mm -hmm. in the relationship, a shift in the framework, and how can I model that shift? Then that will enable somebody who perhaps is coming from a different place to perhaps mm -hmm. be more open to shifting the way that they think. Mm. I really like that. Um particularly because I, I think too often we're in academia, we're in, we're in the space of trying to convince, right? Trying to um, change other people's perspective because you know, as the expert is the one with all the letters after our name, we, we hold the authority um, and we know better. But just as you said, that, that often doesn't help, right? It, it does not create opportunities where, where people actually feel like you care about their outcomes, that you care about them as a person, not just, you know, helping them out or, or that tick mark that you get to check off at the end of the day. Um, and within my field, within adapted physical activity and physical education, there's We've had this term inclusion for a really long time. Um, and whether it's good, bad, or, or a neutral term, there's lots of course discussion that goes around of it. Very, very little, of course, involving the folks who are actually being included, but maybe that's a conversation for another day. Um, but I wonder if you might be able to talk about how you view the idea of inclusion and what, if at all, is, is that achievable? I don't use the word inclusion. Mm -hmm. I don't like the framework. I think it's very well intentioned, mm -hmm. but it falls short. And I want to be clear, this is a very picky, semantic opinion. Mm -hmm. And I don't judge people badly who do use the word inclusion per se. And I don't think it's inherently wrong to use the word inclusion. So let me just get that out of the way. This is not yeah, well, a discussion yeah. of no one should ever use the word under any circumstances. If you do, you're wrong, bad. <laughs> I just don't well, use the word in my work. Yeah. How I frame yeah. what I'm doing or what I'm working for. And the reason why is because for me, to say that we are including someone means by definition we are excluding someone else. Mm. To include someone, even if it is including more and more people, means that someone has to be excluded in order for there to be inclusion. That's reason number one. I don't use that term. And I don't like it. The second reason why I don't use that term and I don't like it is because I think about the way the world is now. And I think I don't want to be included into that. If inclusion means being part of the same oppressive, extractive, exploitative systems that people with more privilege than me have already been part of, I don't want to be included into that. I don't want to yeah. be included into capitalism. I don't want to be included into white supremacy. I don't want to be included into 
into patriarchal ideas of what gender relations and roles and expressions are supposed to be like, I want all of us to be affirmed and supported and valued. And to me, you know, while some people might describe that as, well, that would be inclusion. We want everyone to be included. I don't see it that way. I see it as I don't want to be included. I want justice. Mm. And justice for all, literally for all, means that all of us are able to experience wellness, are able to experience care, are able to have access to basic resources and infrastructure and support necessary, not just to survive, but to live, to have a good chance of thriving. Justice means that everyone is able to live as their true authentic self, to worship or not, to express their gender or their lack of gender in whatever way they choose and feels great and authentic to them, to be able to love and to live in whatever way makes sense for them, for their family, chosen or of origin, for their community, for their culture. Justice means that every one of us can live free of fear, of more trauma, of more violence, of harm, individually or interpersonally or systematically. Justice means that we all get what we need. And when I think about it that way, I think, why would anyone not want that? And I mean, I know the answer to that. That's a rhetorical question. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what we should all be striving for is not a world in which we're included into status quo the way that it is, but a world in which all of us has justice. Yeah. I really like how you phrase that. Um, because you're right. I mean, when you describe it like that, who wouldn't, right? Well, we, we and of course, we know the reasons. Um, but I think for so long, you know, we have diversity and inclusion and um, inclusive classrooms and all of these terms that sort of, again. And in that kind of, case, too, yeah. the word inclusion yeah. becomes a euphemism to say yeah. this is the inclusive soccer team is code for this is the soccer team for the disabled students. And there might be a couple of token non-disabled people that participate basically is an act of charity, but it's not the serious soccer team. It's the inclusion soccer team. Or right. here's the inclusion classroom, which means it's another term for it's the special ed classroom. You're just calling it a different name. And that, yeah. I guess, is that's the third reason I don't like the word. It just becomes euphemistic for yeah. what you really mean is it's the space for the disabled people or other marginalized people and not it is a space that we're cultivating intentionally where all people are actually welcome. Because if yeah. all people were actually welcome, we wouldn't have to say this is the inclusion team right what the yeah. hell is that exactly yeah and i think um i've had a, a wonderful friend and colleague who had written about coaching and this idea of inclusion and you know essentially inclusion for most people being this oh yeah they're in the same space and they fit whatever that means within our structure that we have we don't have to change we don't have to make anything different um they're included and, and we're, we're good. We're good to go. And obviously, for so many reasons, that falls short. Um, and, you know, in, in transitioning a bit, in your, in your book, um, All the Weight of Our Dreams, um, that you co-edited, you wrote in, in one of your chapters, you said, this is why I'm frustrated and disappointed when disab disability advocates advocates sorry it's tuesday near the end of the holidays i'm losing my, <laughs> my ability to talk and read um <laughs> but disability activists speak about racism as though it's over or dismiss racism as irrelevant to it's ableism specific. you mean white yeah. disability activists not yes. all disability activists yeah white. you gotta name that yeah N no i'm i'm reading the quote from your book and i absolutely know because in the next line you say um as well as when organizers for racial justice are completely ignorant to disability issues or dismiss ableism as simply non-existent or unconnected to racial oppression and white supremacy. And I know you've talked kind of on the idea and, and Mia Mingus has talked about this idea that all kind of isms, right? All those oppressions, racism, sexism, ableism, homophobia, all of them 
are interconnected, interrelated, and dependent upon one another. Um, and I've, I've noticed that within my own field, particularly in the fact that we haven't addressed those historical roots based in racist practices or eugenic practices. And so for those interested, right, we ideally we'd love everybody on board, but again, rhetorical question, we know the people who may not be on board with it, but how do those folks start or try to embody a, a justice framework and build a system that's that's based on justice and not simply inclusion? I want to, like I said, just be clear about the contextualization of, of where that yeah. quote comes from, right? That it's addressing what happens when movement spaces prioritize and privilege the people who already have the most privilege and power within a particular otherwise marginalized community. Yeah. And I think frequently about, again, what does it mean to expand our thinking? How can we invite others to expand in their thinking, to expand in their practices, to expand and to deepen their analysis? And, you know, folks who are at the margins of the margins are doing that every day in so many different ways through creating art, through leading research. There are literally whole research projects led by people who are directly impacted in a variety of fields through doing that work in a community setting, not just in an academic or a scholarly one through actually creating alternative systems and processes where you know we're not just reliant on state granted systems or state recognized processes in order to be able to receive and provide care to one another and the more that those of us who are one that think critically about what else can i do to deepen my solidarity to sharpen my analysis to collaborate more frequently with people that might be impacted in ways that I am not, then it's incumbent on us to look to and to listen to and to learn from the people who are already driving change, the people who are already creating what we want in the future. I like that. Um, and I know we've already talked about this idea of, of health, right? And, and all the issues, of course, related to that. And, and you touched on this idea of wellness. And I wonder if, if there are ways in which we can talk about or research or work on health or wellness in a way that isn't or doesn't perpetuate ableism. Is, is there a way we can do that? Again, I think it starts with separating our idea of what constitutes health from assumptions mm -hmm. that health looks the same for everyone that there's an ideal way to talk about exercise, that there's an ideal way to talk about food, that all people's bodies have the exact same needs, that what makes somebody healthy in one context automatically applies to another. And to be intentional about what it means to talk about having access to health or wellness where people from marginalized communities have experienced centuries of exploitation and deprivation that render the means of living well removed from our community. So like, for example, um, when folks talk about a quote unquote food desert or food mm -hmm. apartheid, they mean that people, especially who are low income people of color are less likely to live in areas with easy access to a grocery store that might sell fresh produce. So apart from the question of whether a particular person eats certain kinds of foods or can eat certain kinds of foods for their own religious or medical or other reasons, the ability to choose what kind of food you're eating, the ability to have access to fresh options for food is often tied to race or class. When folks think about the high rates of of specific chronic illnesses and disabilities among native and indigenous communities. You know, Jen Deerenwater, who's an indigenous disability justice activist and organizer, talks about this as tied to centuries of broken treaties of the US mm -hmm. government withholding funding from the Indian Health Service, of the entire racial apartheid that leads to food apartheid in areas where Native people live in larger numbers, both those who are living on reservations and, and urban Native peoples. And, you know, I'm not the expert 
on issues that affect Native or Indigenous peoples, people like Jen R, people you know, who are who are driving work in talking and thinking about food justice and Indigenous sovereignty and disability mm-hmm. justice. But what I know is that you know, if, no matter what community we're looking at, histories of marginalization and oppression directly affect what it means to talk about let's get healthy or let's help mm-hmm. people be healthy. What does it mean to say let's help people be healthy when systems and institutions of power have deprived communities of resources, of ancestral knowledge, of literal money, of actual foods, of medical care, of culturally responsive medical training and education to be able to attend to wellness? So that's two levels. That's one, thinking about what it means to in how we define what counts as health. Yeah. And number two, the context, socially, culturally, and politically, in which we talk about health. Yeah. Well, you're you're giving me so much to think about. Um, and and I I love this framing. And you know, I have a PE background. I'm, I was a physical educator in the public schools for a number of years. Um, before I went and did my doctoral degree in studies and um, and I know some of your work in the past has focused on school related issues such as constraint and seclusion and bullying and violence in schools. Um, I know particularly PE is not the most friendly of spaces for disabled That's kids. An understatement. Yeah, of the year. Um, and I and I and there are so so many so many we could again, have a very long conversation just about the bad practices in PE. Um, But oftentimes, right, that may be, from what we know, that might be a singular opportunity for some kid to have a dedicated space set aside for physical activity. Or it might be a space in which um, kids have the safety to engage in activity. Or it might be the space that they get to experience or get exposed to physical activities they might not in the future. So, you know, there's benefit there, but it's obviously not being realized. And so how can teachers, how can educators, how can physical educators apply a justice aspect to to their own classroom? How can we go from you know, not being a space where you know, it is a space that's ripe with bullying and, and violence. How can we, again, change that practice? And that's a much bigger conversation. Than this <laughs> Probably. <few minutes. laughs> yeah. I would start by encouraging teachers to talk to and listen to the kids in your class. Mm-hmm. They are the expert on what yeah. feels good, on what feels supportive, on what they need. Listen to the kids that you're teaching. Ask them. Not in public in front of everyone else. Talk to them. Find out what would make PE an enjoyable space. What would make PE a supportive space? What kinds of activities feel good for them to do? And start there. I think that's so great. And I really love that message. Um, And that would be a great place to stop. But... I know you're developing your own tarot deck and I want to hear about it. And where can I buy it? Can't buy it yet. I'm okay. working on it now. I'm actually hoping to have the next several of the major arcana, arcana available to share publicly in the next couple of weeks. So stay on the lookout. If you're following the Kickstarter, cool. there will be another project update very soon. So for anyone awesome. who's watching this, like where the fuck is your project update? It's coming. I promise. Yeah. Come on. Um, all right. I warned all of the folks who backed the project in the beginning that I have ADD and this will happen <laughs> on disabled standard time. And it is happening. I'm very excited. Oh. And probably they will be available for purchase from my website at some point. Uh, yeah. I really need to figure out how to integrate that capability. I'm kind of bad at capitalism, which is just as well. Capitalism <laughs> trash. But I that's know. a whole other conversation. <laughs> Yeah, no, we could certainly go on forever because I too am bad at capitalism. Um, And I love that you have now just introduced me to disabled standard time because I too, as well as my wife, which can be 
quite an interesting combination. We both have ADD <laughs> and um, we can be having four conversations simultaneously and we'll pick it up four hours later and still know where everything's going. But, you know, the dishes might not get done for a few days. So I 100% understand that. Um, Lydia, I've loved our conversation. You have given me and I hope those listening and watching so much to think about. I enjoy our conversations every time I am so lucky to have them with you. Um, and I, I look forward to seeing what you're doing in the, in the new year. Um, and I hope we can continue to connect. I would love to do that. Thank you again for having awesome. me. And now yeah. I've got a bread to rise. Yes, absolutely. You go and I'm, I'm seriously going to go to Instagram and check out those pictures of that bread um, when you put them up there. So all about it. Thank you so much, Lydia. I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. I know you are also in academia. So best of luck with finishing out your semester. We're almost there. Uh, thank you again so much. You too. Bye. All right. See ya. Uh, let's see. I'm going to put you in the green room because I got to say all the outro stuff. There we go. Where's the button? Here we go. Got it. Thanks, Lydia. All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Again, our guest is Lydia XC Brown. Um, I loved our conversation. I hope you did too. You can find more of her work, uh, or sorry, more of their work at their website. I'm sorry about that, Lydia. Um, I was reading a past copy that had um, the wrong pronouns. I apologize. Um, again, you can find her tarot deck. You can find their work um, online. It is, I believe, Lydia changed her website to LydiaXZBrown.com, if I'm correct. But I will put that in the show notes um, to make sure you all have access to that. If you missed any part of today's conversation, you can watch the whole replay on YouTube um, or even whenever I get to it, um, you'll be able to listen to the podcast, which hopefully will be out here in the coming months, and it'll be available wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, this was our last conversation for the year. Um, I'm hoping through your support, through some other mechanisms, I might be able to do more series in the future. I've enjoyed these conversations, and I look forward to having more in the future. Um, if you'd like to support the show, I'm currently um, on Patreon. You can find me at patreon.com slash that hippie prof. Uh, I, again, love to send out a thank you to my friend, Adrian Doc Blust, who put together the music you heard at the intro and the music you'll hear just in a second uh, for our outro. Lastly, um, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. I couldn't do this without you. Um, I'll see you next time. Bye. We're off now, 